I'm just spending an entire week on nothing but sequel. Looking forward to meeting new people, seeing old friends. Um, also, Dr. DeWitt's talk keynote on Thursday will definitely be a highlight for me. So I'm really looking forward to the SQL Cat session on Parallel Data Warehouse when they explain some of their customer implementations. This is really relevant to me and I'm really looking forward to seeing their real life experiences and what they've done. Thursday, I'm definitely looking forward to the Women in Technology luncheon. Uh, having a daughter who is showing some interest to me in getting into learning a program and learning to use computers more interactively and being able to create things on the computer as well, that's definitely a topic that's very, very fresh in my mind and something that I really want to get more into. I'm excited about the sessions that show how to use SQL 2012 and SharePoint 2013 together. My, my favorite session to come up first is the Microsoft BI stack on top of SQL 2012 and SharePoint 2013. I am most excited about networking. It sounds kind of cliche, but this really is a family. I am so excited to catch up with old friends that you talk to online over the year and just network and meet new people because these, these relationships really do last a lifetime. The energy here is just wonderful, especially when you compare it to other, other sorts of conferences. You know, I've, I've been to Hadoop Summit and some of the things that are not Microsoft-centric. The energy here is just so much higher as a whole, and also it's also very focused on one particular topic, which is great because the synergy in the room and in the whole convention center is just wonderful. This is the only place where you can meet with such a large cross-section of the experts from Microsoft in particular in one place at one setting. While you're here this week, be sure to take the time to talk to somebody new, someone you're sitting next to at a session or you meet at a meal. You never know, they might be working to solve the exact same problem you are, and they might point you to a resource that you don't know existed. Past Summit is more than just a conference, it's all about connect, share, and learn. You are all part of this diverse community, and the connections you make this week can carry you throughout your career. Please welcome past Executive Vice President Douglas McDowell. Morning, good morning. Welcome to day two. Wow, we've got a really deep ballroom this morning. Thanks, A15, y'all are here. We've got a great set of sessions and activities today. Tom's gonna to go through a lot of those things. I'm gonna second a reminder that he's gonna tell you, make sure you take your badge tonight to get into the party. He'll tell you that again, but it's worth saying twice because it's a pain at the door if you don't have it. Hope y'all had a great time at the exhibitor reception last night. Hope you made a, a few laps around there. Make time to go back today when there's less food and chaos there. Spend time with those exhibitors. Really important, they're partnering with us in the community and they make this event possible. So go see how they can add value to your organization. Learn from them. So I'm here today to give a quick update on the uh, past finances, give you a little snapshot of our fiscal health. To start off, kind of a point of order or clarification is PASS is a not-for-profit organization. And what that means is that we're set up to serve our members, and that means that we're not seeking to yield profits for a investor, shareholder, owner of any type. Instead, what we bring in as revenue goes back into our membership, into our community. So also as a point of governance, since we've got 4,000 members together, we treat the summit as our annual general meeting. And that's why we do this financial update from the keynote stage. If you want details, there's lots of financial details, budgeting details, everything on the governance page of sequelpass.org. You're welcome to check that out. But I think that you'll find what I go through with you today is rather engaging. I'm a little biased though. So fundraising sources, where do we get our money from? And because we're a not-for-profit, I think the right vernacular is fundraising. Well, we rely on a number of different sources, but this event right here, the summit, is our primary fundraiser. So if you look at the visual breakdown here, represented as a wheel, over three quarters of the revenues that we get are from this event. I think that all of you that have gone to multiple technical conferences will agree that the value you get from this conference is amazing. But because of the efficiencies of our HQ and event planning team, we're able to actually have proceeds from this that is able to fund the rest of the organization. 
So while you're here getting good value, your contribution from your registration fees makes this whole organization possible. And I thank you very much for being here and for contributing to the organization. Your registration fee, critical for us to do what we do. Coming in second behind Summit, you'll see a yellow area, and that's a net new area for us in the last fiscal year. Just for clarification, our fiscal year goes from Je July 1 through June 30th. So looking back over the 2013 fiscal year, this is what this breakdown is. So we had a new conference, the Business Analytics Conference. A few of you were there, I hope. We had 900 folks there, not bad for a first conference. And we managed to have an overage or proceeds, or if you want to call it profit in a not-for-profit organization. We made about $100,000 on that event. So that event already has diversified our revenue sources and has started to contribute to funding other parts of our organization. You can also see a few other wedges there. We have virtual events. There's sponsorships that are associated with that. And then an other area. Other can, uh, includes virtual chapter sponsorships, some um, additional support from Microsoft, advertising revenue. But that, that's what makes up a, a majority of our fundraising sources, or all of our fundraising sources, rather. Over the last two years, in my capacity, I've had the opportunity to work closely with the other directors and with headquarters to transform our budgeting process. We've take a really, taken a really holistic performance management approach where we looked at the overall organizational goals and said, are we actually putting our money where our mouth is? Are we saying that what we want to do is how we're, we're deciding that we're going to spend our money? The way that we do a budgeting process and the way that we also organizationally set up PASS is that we have portfolios. So each event or um, set of initiatives is a portfolio. SQL Saturday, virtual events, summit, business analytics conference, finance, those are all portfolios. And each one has its own budget. And so within each of those sub-budgets, we make sure that they're aligned with our organizational goals. A big one has been international growth. Another one was you know, starting a new event around uh, business analytics and that, new, um, and that new audience. So all of those were initiatives that we needed to align all of our budgets to. And we also took a look at each one of those portfolios and we said, is this a revenue positive or revenue negative portfolio? Pretty straightforward, but critical to think about it in, those, in that way because we can't keep commitments we can't introduce new revenue positive portfolios or initiatives without having adequate funding from our revenue um, positive, did I say negative or positive? Anyway, you can't, you can't add new, new revenue negative portfolios without adequate funding from revenue positive portfolios. So that's been a part of a very deliberate and focused process that we've gone through to change our budgeting process. And it takes some work, and the work, the heavy lifting has really come from headquarters because each person that's assigned to a portfolio that pairs up with a director to work in a portfolio has been instrumental in making sure that we get really accurate and efficient budgeting and it aligns well with the overall organizational goals. So a big thanks to Pass HQ for that. An extension of that is that we've started a practice of self-insurance, taking monies that overages, proceeds from um, past years and saying, we need to make sure that we have a rainy day fund. And so today I want to tell you that we've got a million dollars in reserves. And this is excellent because for you old timers out there, you can remember that we've been through some hurricanes. We've been through um, some volcanic ash storms. We've been through all kinds of crazy things that put the overall organization at risk. And some of you might say, wow, a million dollars. Think of what we could what we could go start up with that. But it's critical that we have that rainy day fund so that if we have to cash that in because something disastrous happens, it's there. It's assuring that PASS has sustainability that we haven't had those type of securities in the past. And so it's been a long path to get there and, uh, and now we have a very structured process to do that and the good news is, is that, that we've got a good piggy bank. It's not a really magic number, but just for reference, we try and put about 10 to 12 percent into our reserves of what our expected revenues is, and that's kind of a, a good waterline for us to give us that type of security that we need. So where does all the money go? Looking back at last fiscal year, our overall 
fundraising was somewhere around $7.6 million. Well, it goes back into the community. Everything that we do, again, we have a visual breakdown here. This event is not free. A lot of it goes back into the quality and uh, making this a premium event. It's a big part of that wheel there. Business Analytics Conference, another, you know, the, the second highest fundraiser. It's also uh, has a, a cost structure associated with it. But then other things that we support in the community. You know, yesterday Bill told you about 700,000 education hours that we provided uh, to the community last year. A lot of that is funded <clears throat> by investments that we make in IT, in HQ. HQ is one of our most critical investments because all of you, if you're not a volunteer now, you're a volunteer in training, you're a candidate to be a volunteer, and we need you. But really to make volunteers, to extend our volunteer network to facilitate it, we need a really strong, cohesive HQ. And headquarters is critical to making all of us as volunteers successful, keeping us on task, and multiplying our efforts. So they're a huge investment. Right now, IT has three guys, and so much we depend on that. We've got 520 websites that they're keeping up, all the SQL Saturday sites, all the um, virtual chapters and chapter portals and event sites. It's, a, it's amazing, and 15 online services that they support. So that's a good example of service providing infrastructure that makes us as volunteers um, successful and makes it possible to serve the community. So one of our initiatives, you see a call out there, has been international expansion. So just putting the slides together, we did a little bit of back of napkin math and said, hey, over the past year, what have we been doing kind of above and beyond what we normally would have done just to keep the lights on in North America? How have we been you know, making extra effort to fund our international expansion? And it came in around 30%, which is a pretty good number and, and goes back to that performance management approach where we're saying, are we budgeting according to what our initiatives are? It's a little bit of information for you. So I want to wrap things up. The, the summary statement that I have for you today or, or points is that we're in great financial health. We uh, have a very strong but becoming diversified um, source of revenue and fundraising. Really excellent budgeting process to keep us on track going forward. And then a million dollars in the piggy bank. So I think that we're in a great place to keep coming back here every year, keep um, go into uh, the business analytics co conference every year and to keep pick, um, driving our, our local and virtual events that are so critical to all of you. So thanks for your participation. Thanks for par being part of this community. Again, if you're not a volunteer yet, get on that. It's going to be a very rewarding experience for you. Be part of the, uh, be part of the experience. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to past president Bill Graziano. Thank you, Douglas. You can stay on stage with me. Oh, you need a demo? <laughs> so today I have the bittersweet task of recognizing and saying goodbye and thank you to some folks who have given so much of themselves to the past community and are now moving off the past board. Our outgoing executive VP of finance, Douglas McDowell, and I have served together for six years on the board. Douglas has been a past volunteer since 2001 first as a chapter leader, regional mentor, and then on the past board. Under his guidance, past reached new milestones in finance, governance, chapters, and IT. Douglas also spearheaded the past business analytics conference and was instrumental in the event's success. Thank you, Douglas, for your incredible service, and we look forward to your continued involvement in the community. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. We also say farewell to Director Rob Farley of Australia who joined the board as an international advisor before being elected for the 2012-2013 term. During his time on the board, Rob oversaw the 24 hours of pass and our popular and growing SQL Saturday portfolio. Good luck to you, Rob, as you continue to spread the word about pass down under. I've served on the pass board with immediate past president Rushab Mena now for eight years. Rushab, you want to come out on stage? Rushab. 
Shava and I have been through a lot together in our eight years. We've had some good times. We've had some interesting times. Shab has been the VP of Marketing, the Executive VP of Finance, and the President, each of those roles before me. So I followed him through each of those. I can tell you how he's instrumental in the globalization of PASS, how his appointment of three board advisors led directly, eventually, to our election of a, of a, of a board member from EMEA. But I have a better story about Rashab that I want to share. So years ago at our European conference, uh, we had a gentleman named Donald Farmer scheduled to give a keynote. Unfortunately, Donald couldn't make it at the last minute, and so Rushab stepped up at the last minute and delivered this demo like his own, or the entire keynote as his own. Any of you remember Donald Farmer and what he looked like? Big, gorgeous, flowing locks of hair coming all the way down here. Rushab, maybe not so much. Until he walked on stage, <laughs> this best Donald Farmer imitation delivered an amazing, amazing keynote. So Rushab, thank you so much for all that you've done. We appreciate it. On behalf of PASS and our members, I'd like to give you a little token of our appreciation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, and Rashab, I almost forgot. I have one more thing for you. Oh, I had to put that on. Hopefully this will uh, stand you in good stead. <laughs> And those aren't the stairs you, okay. <laughs> now I'd like to hand things off to the current Vice President of Marketing and the incoming past president. Please join me in welcoming Thomas LaRock. All right, right here. thank you. Good morning. I'm real excited that everybody's here to join me at hashtag SQL Pass, hashtag Summit 13. I'm not just thrilled to see you all here today, but I'm also thrilled that we're stream live streaming the Pass TV for the second straight year. Uh, I got the numbers from yesterday, uh, just this morning. We had about 3,000 viewers from 79 different countries joining us online. So I'm really excited about that, and I'm excited to have it. Yeah. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to introduce to you the incoming PASS executive team. As Bill had mentioned, I will be the president starting on January 1st. Joining me will be Adam Jorgensen exec as executive vice president. Adam? No. <laughs> Denise McInerney will take over for me as vice president of marketing. <laughs> and Bill will become the immediate PASS president. Yes, <laughs> Bill too. New to the board will be Jen Stirrup. Jen, where are you? Jen, is Jen here? Oh, she's back there. Hi, Jen. <laughs> Jen has the EMEA regional seat. Uh, Tim Ford will have the US Canada seat. Tim's right here in the front. <laughs> and Amy Lewis, stand up again, Amy. Stand up. <laughs> so way back in 1999, for some of us here, uh, this is my 10th summit, so I don't go back to 1999, but way back in 1999, I've been told, the very first summit took place by a core group of DBAs and developers, and they were able to harness something special, a sense of community, and that is a unique community that we're all a part of here today. Last year, we decided that we wanted to broaden our audience to include not just people focused on SQL Server, but uh, to expand into all data professionals. So we launched some new virtual chapters. We had a 24 hours of pass event dedicated and that helped lead into our inaugural BA conference. With all that underway, we decided that it was time to update our pass mission statement to reflect the expanded community. The statement now broadens our audience from SQL Server pros to data pros leveraging Microsoft data platform technologies. And we look forward to our efforts supporting the community globally. With that, following on the success of last year's Business Analytics Conference in Chicago, we are going to head to the West Coast next year, May 7th through 9th, in San Jose, and we're going to do it again, the past Business Analytics Conference. Now, don't forget to like the Microsoft BI Facebook page to enter the Power BI Conference, and you get a chance to win a complimentary registration, uh, or you can head over to passbaconference.com and sign up for the event today. 
And it's never too early to talk about next year's PASS Summit. It will take place in Seattle from uh, November 4th through 7th. That's the first week in Seattle. And you know you don't want to miss out on it. Uh, everybody here had a good time so far? First two days been good? Good. So who out there right now is a first timer? Awesome. And, and you're a first timer and you're already planning on coming back next year, right? Excellent. Early bird registration is only open until December 1st this year. So you need to sign up online a little bit early and, or you can go to the registration counter here in Charlotte. A few things to talk about. Don't miss out for today and tomorrow. Uh, number one, the WIT luncheon. It will be here in the Crown Ballroom, right? That's what this is, the Cisco Crown Ballroom, excuse me. Uh, the topic is beyond stereotypes, equality, gender neutrality, and valuing team diversity. I will be there. It's my eighth WIT luncheon, and uh, I will be introducing the moderator this year. Tomorrow, we do the Birds of a Feather luncheon, so grab a seat at the table of your favorite topic. And we have, I think, 50 tables this year covering uh, lots of technical and community topics. Tonight, we're gonna be heading over for the community appreciation party. It's gonna be at the NASCAR Hall of Fame, which is right behind us. So if you were to exit right from here, we made it really easy for anybody that's a NASCAR fan. It's actually three left turns <laughs> and you will get to the main entrance for the NASCAR Hall of Fame. It couldn't be easier. Uh, and as Douglas had mentioned, please, you need to have your badge. You need to be wearing a badge in order to get in. Microsoft has some instructor-led labs today. Uh, instructor-led labs on Power Pivot today in room 213. You might want to check that out. And don't forget the SQL Clinic in room 219. How many people visited the SQL Clinic yesterday? Uh, how many people need to go see it today? I see a few more people. That's right. Let's get down to the SQL Clinic. It's a nice uh, opportunity to take advantage of be interacting with the SQL Server team. If you're having a hard time getting to all the sessions, like, like I do, I never seem to have enough time to get to everything I want to see, don't forget there are session recordings that will be made available. Stop by the registration desk, and you can order them before you leave Charlotte. Now I'm very pleased to introduce today's keynote speaker. The ever popular David DeWitt is back on this stage this year, and we are very, very thrilled to have him here in Charlotte, as I, I'm sure you are too. He's a former professor and currently a technical fellow at the Microsoft Jim Gray Systems Lab, and he will be covering the why, what, and how of Hecaton. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Please make the most out of your last two days at Summit, and join me in welcoming David DeWitt. Thank you, I got my own. Morning. Okay, let's hope this works. Uh, I was real worried about Microsoft IT taking over my laptop. Um, so it's, it is great to be back. Well, I work for Microsoft. They like to hit install new passwords. So, uh, and that didn't happen, which I'm happy about. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author on this talk, Reema Nemi, but we'll come back to Reema at the end. Let's see if the clicker is going to work. Okay, here we go. So some of you are thinking, this guy again. You know, I get tired of hearing his keynotes. Uh, they're hard to understand. Um, if you think the ones in the past have been hard to understand, take two Advil now, because you're going to need them. <laughs> now, what, what is Quentin thinking? Here's what, you know, you're thinking, what's he going to talk about? Quentin's saying, what's he going to say? Are, are the marketing people going to be upset? Am I going to be upset? Quentin used to be my boss, but he's not my boss any longer, so it's OK. He's also used to driving, but today's my turn to drive. So this is where we'll go. So when I got asked to do this keynote last July, I was saying, what could I possibly talk about? Six years ago, I did parallel database systems. Then I did column stores, query optimization. That did make your head hurt. Big data uh, two years ago. And I really thought I'd run out of things to talk about. Uh, but then I remembered we were going to really announce that Hecaton was available as part of CPP2. And I want to acknowledge all the people that worked on the Hecaton team because they worked really hard to make that CTP happen by yesterday. I mean, there were a lot of long nights and weekends. So I want to talk about Hecaton today. And you, I got a good lead in from Quentin and Tracy yesterday. But today I'm going to go really in depth on Hecaton because it's really totally different on the inside. It's not something we just cobbled together in the last couple of years. I uh, actually managed the project soon after it was begun, more than five years ago. Um, so it's a, been a big effort. 
It's an amazing product, and I can't be more proud of the team that put it together. It is indeed an OLTP rocket ship. So now, the marketing guys don't like Hecaton. They called it, they renamed it in memory OLTP. Uh, but I'm going to refer to it as Hecaton in the, in the uh, talk today. In memory OLTP is kind of a mouthful. And I think you guys should vote, OK? You know, there are a lot of you tweeting. You can vote uh, by, by tweeting either uh, in memory OLTP or Hecaton. And you can tweet about that instead of tweeting about, you know, whether my pants are ironed and whether my shirt is tucked in. So tweet on those names, OK, instead of picking on me. Uh, here's actually the entire team. I took this photo about a month ago. I think it includes everybody that made this product uh, happen. Uh, and it includes some people from Microsoft Research, a lot of developers, a lot of testers, marketing, product development, product management. It's an amazing team, and I'm incredibly proud to see what they took this small incubation I was managing into just a super product. Now, I hope you'll forgive me. Sometimes um, the CVPs have been criticized too much about pushing product, and I hope you're not going to criticize me bloggers for pushing product today, because I, I really, really wanted to take this opportunity to explain how Hecaton worked. So we're going to cover three things. We're going to cover the what of Hex Hecaton, the why of, and the how of Hecaton. And I want to try to explain to you how it differs from the core relational engine that's part of SQL Server. So Hecaton is memory optimized but durable. Um, and I think that's important to understand. If the power goes out, you haven't lost any data. Very high performance OLTP, but it can be used for many more things than just OLTP. High performance relational query engine, fully integrated into SQL Server 2014. This is not a bolt-on. It's not a uh, new product you have to learn. And it's totally architected for, for modern CPUs. And I'm going to explain that in great, gory detail today, and I hope you'll bear with me. I also hope, I, at the end, I'll give you directions on how to find this deck. It's actually already posted. Uh, for those of you that don't have anything better to do and don't want to listen to my talk, you can go see if you can find it. Um, I expect that some of you will want to take the time to really go back and look at the slides later. So I think of this as a big MOOC, especially for those people on uh, Pass TV, a massive online course. There are a lot of you out there. Uh, I think you know, it's worth downloading the deck later, clicking through the animations, uh, really understanding how the thing works. Um, now, why did we need a new query engine? Many OLTP workloads now fit in memory. And for example, you can buy an HP DL980 with two, gig, two terabytes of RAM for about $50,000. That's a pretty amazing box. There are certain kinds of workloads um, that SQL Server just can no longer meet. Um, and unlike big data, which I have talked about, and which is really my true love, uh, uh, OLTP, OLTP workloads are growing at a more modest rate, and we, we foresee an increasing number of these workloads being able to fit in memory of future computers. So why a new query engine? Well, historically, OLT performance has been uh, improved by a bunch of things. One, improved software. The TPC benchmarks over the years, starting with Jim Gray's early benchmarks, the debit credit benchmark, TPCA, TPCB, CE, have driven the developers to do better, better, better job at, at uh, producing a high performance system. We've benefited from CPU performance and memory sizes doubling every couple of years, OK? As we all know, CPUs no longer are getting any faster. Those days are truly over, and existing software is mature. It's really, it's, we've done as much as we can with the mainline products. And CPUs, you know, are, as I, got, I mentioned earlier, no longer getting faster, well has been drained dry. Now, when we started the Hecaton project, that name didn't come out of thin air. We didn't say Decaton. We, we picked the name Hecaton because the goal was 100x. We didn't quite get there. So Hecaton, if you actually go to Wikipedia, it's a monster. I don't know, you know, this name's a little bit weird, but it's sort of Greek for 100. You can think about it. It's a, mo a mythical monster with 50 heads and 100 arms. So when we started this project, we picked the name Hecaton because we put the stake in the sand to get 100x. We're not quite there yet. Sometimes we're 10x, sometimes we're 30x. Customers have seen us 18 to 20x, and we'll come back to that at the end. 
it, it will vary. Some applications will probably run slower with Hecaton than SQL Server, but we will get there. But that was the goal, 100x. Now, if you're burning a million instructions per second and only reaching 100 TPS and you're out of CPU, if you want to get to 1,000, you have to cut the number of instructions executed by every transaction by a factor of 10. That gets us to 100,000 instructions per second. If you want to get to 100x, you've got to cut the number of instructions to 10,000 per transaction. And this is really just impossible with today's uh, database software. So getting to 100x, truly mission impossible with any existing query engine. And there are a flood of new products. Oracle times 10, I, uh, IBM SolidDB, VoltDB, and SAP HANA. Now, that's got a red mark on it because SAP HANA really isn't an OLTP engine. It's a in-memory column store scale-out solution with some OLTP capabilities. It is not a competitor for Hecaton, no matter what anybody or any marketing person says. With SQL Server 2014, we're introducing Hecaton. Now, why, why new query engine? Somebody actually came up to me yesterday and said, uh, why not just pin all the tables in memory? That will not do the trick. And I'm going to explain now for about the next 10 minutes or so uh, why just pinning the tables in a RAM disk or in memory will not do the trick. Performance is still going to be limited by uh, the use of latches for shared data structures. I'm going to explain that. The use of locking as a concurrency control mechanism. Locks become hotspots. Latches become hotspots. All of you that have seen the tail insert problem on SQL know about this problem and all the tricks to get around it. Hecaton eliminates the needs for any tricks. Finally, interpretation of query plans. So I'm going to next step through these limitations of why, what, why latches, locking, and interpretation are bottlenecks even if you pin all the tables in memory. So, Database systems have a shared buffer pool. And the buffer pool is where the software holds data as it's read from disk. This enables multiple queries or transactions to share data pages, roots of B trees, et cetera. And there are a lot of fields in a buffer pool frame, but a buffer pool but it at least has a page number and a place to hold the data. So there's my buffer pool. It's got seven entries or something like that. In reality, it has a million entries, uh, and it's got a lot more fields. Now, you're going to see these kind of graphs, these kind of timelines throughout this talk. So let's get everybody understanding what's going on. Time is going uh, left to right on the slide. At least I hope that's how it's going. And I'm going to, throughout this talk, use this kind of animation to illustrate uh, things happening in time. So pretend the buffer pool is empty, and query one comes along and checks for page seven. You know, it, somebody else might have brought it in, but it's going to go to the buffer manager and say, is page seven in the buffer pool? Page one in the buffer, page seven in the buffer pool. And the buffer manager is going to say, no, it allocates a frame, and then it, and it blocks the query and initiates an I.O. Now, some amount of time later, you know, 10 milliseconds, 25 milliseconds, you know, maybe one millisecond if you've got the database on an SSD, the I.O. completes and query one can continue. All is good. But remember this data structure. It's a shared data structure by all the queries running in the system. When the I.O. completes, the buffer page, the, the page of the database is in the buffer pool. But what happens if at about that time on that timeline, Q2 checks for page 7? The buffer manager is going to say, if, we, if you know, oh, yeah, it's in frame 3. And Q2 will read garbage. Obviously, this is not a reasonable solution. So we introduced a notion of a lock uh, when we started building multi-threaded database systems back in the early 80s, and a special kind of lock that we call a latch. And basically, a lock you can think of as, as typically it's a, they can be exclusive, but there can be shared, shared latches. Um, and um, it's, there's, no, there's no deadlock detection on them. So transactions or queries typically only hold two latches at a time. So associated with every frame in the buffer pool is not only a page number and a place to hold the data while it's in memory, but also a latch. Now what happens with latches is query one asks the buffer manager is page seven in the buffer pool. 
Uh, the buffer manager says, no, but I'm going to allocate a frame, and I'm going to put a latch on that frame. Now the I.O. is initiated, and if Q7 comes along right now and checks for page 7, it's going to get blocked by that latch. Uh, and when the I.O. completes, both Q1 and Q2 will get released and will continue. So latches are used uh, throughout the system, and they be can become, especially on certain hot pages in the buffer pool, uh, very contentious spots, wasting a lot of CPU time. And remember, we're trying to cut the number of instructions per transaction down. We can't have queries or transactions sitting on spin locks. Um, there would be a big performance hit from the use of latches. Every shared data structure must be protected by a latch. And that includes the buffer manager, the lock table, any shared data structure in a multiprocessor environment running lots of queries concurrently, they all must be protected by latches, and they are. And latches consume tons of time um, uh, in the execution of a, of a high performance system. Why query engine number two? The use of concurrency control, locking for concurrency control. So I've got a real simple example I've taught many times. So think of this, this scenario. We have query one. Query one wants to add 100 to the database, some database record A. And it's going to you know, read it, you know, get it, the, the page holding A into the buffer pool. It's going to read the value. It's going to update it on the data page. And then it's going to write it back uh, to the buffer pool and then eventually the disk. Query 2 does the same thing, but it's going to add 500 to A. It's going to read it. It's going to update it. And it's going to write it. Now, again, we have one of these, these animations. Query 1 reads A. A is 1,000. It's going to update it. It's going to write it. And now A is 1,100 back on disk. Then query 2 comes along and does its thing. And the final correct value is 1,600. We ran what's called a serial schedule. We ran query 1 and query 2. And it was just it was by happenstance um, that Q2 came completely after Q1. But with, and we, we call this a special kind of schedule called a serial schedule. Now look at this other schedule where Q1 starts by reading A. Q2 reads A immediately after Q1. Q1 does its update of A to equal A plus 100. It writes it back. And lo and behold, A is 1,100, which reflects the update of query 1. But notice query 2 snuck in and read the value of A at 1,000. And it's going to take that 1,000 value it read, add 500, write it back, and get 1,500. And lo and behold, the database is not consistent. So this is why we have a concurrency control mechanism inside every database system. And this is, this is not a serial schedule. Q, the final value of A does not reflect Q1's update of A equal A plus 100. So we need, when we built, started to build database systems, we needed a concurrency control mechanism. In the mid-'80s, the database field looked at a lot of different mechanisms. Uh, my mentor and the person my lab is named after, Jim Gray, for, former IBM employee, Tandem employee, DEC employee, Microsoft employee when he, when he was lost at sea, invented a technique called two-phase locking. And that emerged as a standard that almost all database systems use, and certainly SQL Server. There are a variety of lock types that you can think of just two for now. There's an exclusive lock type, which means what it, you know, it means what it says. A transaction that has an exclusive lock, nobody else should be allowed to see it, either with an exclusive lock or shared access. And Jim invented, had this really brilliant insight, which, which if a database system follows it uh, and uses locking, will guarantee that every inner relieving of actions of con concurrently executing transactions yield something equivalent to a serial schedule. First, before accessing a piece of data, it must acquire the appropriate lock. If a query is accessing a piece of data to update it, it's got to get an exclusive lock. If it's up accessing it to read it, it's got to get a shared lock. And that's, that's requirement number one. You, you always go through the lock manager, and that's done, obviously, transparently underneath the covers inside the database system. Number two, once a query, and this is really the thing that that Jim is really famous for. He was able to prove that once a query uh, releases its first lock, it is not allowed to acquire any additional locks. We call that two-phase locking. 
So the lock manager determines under the cover whether two locks are compatible. And if the rule, rules are followed, then the, the schedule that's produced sort of under the covers automatically without anybody thinking about what's going on is equivalent to some serial schedule. And serial schedules can be proven to always produce the correct results. The final state of the database is correct. And Jim got the Turing Award, which is like the Nobel Prize in computer science for this. Um, uh, one of the earliest uh, no, uh, Turing Award winners um, and the second in the database field. Excuse me, third in the database field. And the last in the database field. We've not had one since. So locking was great when we had disk-based database systems, when the dominant uh, thing limiting performance was I.O. But as we go to main memory database systems, locks become a problem. They are an issue. So there's a nice little animation about locking. Um, so let's, let's look at how they get used. We start off uh, at the database state A equal 1,000. Q1 now wants to update this value A, so it's going to set an exclusive lock. It then can proceed to read it because no, no other transaction had a lock on A. Q2 attempts to set an exclusive lock because it also wants to update it. It gets blocked, which is goodness. A, you know, Q1 finishes up. Then Q1 finishes up. It, when it terminates, it releases its lock. Um, Q2 is unblocked. Uh, Q2 gets to read A, uh, updates A by 500, and the final value is what we want it to be. Now, locking uh, also, you know, the lock table is also a shared data structure, and we actually use very fancy lock techniques, hierarchical locking, but setting a lock involves setting several latches because, it's, you know, the lock table is a shared data structure. Lat latches are expensive, contention uh, is bad for the CPU utilization, uh, it causes queries to block. Blocking is not so bad when you're doing disk IOs. Blocking is a killer when you're building a main memory database system and you want to get, you know, 100x performance. And finally, you need this pesky little thing for deadlock detection and resolution. You know, you can get cycles where A is waiting on B and B is waiting on A, and somebody has to come along and figure out which, which of the two queries should be aborted. So that's more overhead. When we did Hecaton, we wanted to get rid of all that stuff, okay? So we started over, and that's why it's a five-year effort. It's not something that we just dreamed up in the last year and decided to slap into SQL Server 2014. The third biggie is interpretation of query plans. And again, not a big issue. OK, click the machine. So after a query is parsed and optimized, an execution plan is produced. And there's some, you know, the SQL is turned into some operators, selections, projections, joins, all the basic building blocks. And this execution plan um, is given to a query interpreter that walks the tree of operators and executes them in a certain order, typically bottom up, um, and actually takes charge of taking the optimized plan and executing it. Now, when the database is on disk, this interpretation cost is lost in the noise. You know, it's really, it's minimal, but when it's in memory, it's a big deal. And so when you saw Tracy press that magic button yesterday to make things run five times or eight times as fast, he was actually taking the, the stored proc and turning it into a DLL uh, by translating the stored procedure first into C, and I'm going to come back to this, and then running it at machine level speeds. So that's the third reason. So, so all these are about you know, the latches, the locking, and the interpretation are all the reasons why simply pinning the pages of the database in memory are not going to get you 100x. They're not even going to get you 10x, OK? So these things become the blockers when there's no I.O. involved. So a quick recap. For shared data structures, SQL Server Classic, whatever you want to call SQL Server 2014, that's the part when you're not using Hecaton, uses latches for all the shared data structures, the buffer pool, the lock manager. It uses two-phase locking as the way to coordinate updates and accesses by multiple concurrent transactions. And then it uses interpretation for query execution. Now, Hecaton, and this is 
what this deep dive is about to teach you about these things. Hecaton is totally different. It uses uh, lock-free data structures. I'm going to try to explain to you what lock-free data structures are for all shared data structures. So, so there are no latches left in the Hecaton engine. We no longer use locking as the concurrency control mechanism. We use something called optimistic, multi-version, timestamp concurrency control. And this is going to make your head spin. I remember trying to teach this to graduate students in my graduate level classes. Uh, uh, fr frequently, they'd find bugs in my lecture. The bloggers are probably finding bugs in my lecture right now. Um, but we, we, we're doing something entirely different for concurrent access by queries that use Hecaton inside the box. And finally, as I alluded to, and Tracy demonstrated uh, uh, yesterday, we're going to take queries and we're going to combine them, we're going to compile them into a DLL that will load when we execute. So these are the goodies of Hecaton. These are the thing that give us 10x, 30x, and hopefully someday 100x to reach what I think uh, we ought to really try to get at uh, eventually. So if you peer into the covers of SQL Server 2014, you'll see a T-SQL, and this is a very simplified view, and I apologize, a parser, metadata management, the query optimizer, and you'll see the standard relational engine that you've, you know, has been there from, from the beginning of, uh, uh, not the beginning, obviously we've improved it, but standard relational engine that deals with disk-based data. You also know that we have a second query engine inside called in-memory column store, codename Apollo. Um, it actually works both on memory resonant data as well as disk resonant data, uh, unlike some of our competitors. Um, and it's a second query engine inside under the covers. And for SQL Server 2014, we've added a third engine, uh, Hecaton. Um, now, it's fully integrated. Uh, and queries can span all three engines um, through something we call uh, interop, and I'm going to come to that. So you can have a query that touches a, a clustered column index in Apollo, a standard SQL table, and a hecaton table, and it will work transparently. Module of very few language, few, very few restrictions for V1. And obviously we'll be drastically improving on it for future releases. I hope I didn't say anything the marketing people didn't want me to say. OK, how do you use Hecaton? It's really easy. Step one, create a memory optimized table. And you saw this yesterday in Tracy's slide. So you'll look here, you'll see there's some new keywords with memory optimized equal on, and then durability. So there can be two kinds of durability. There can be schema only and schema and data. Some, some, some of our customers are using Hecaton for session state only, and they don't care about durability. Uh, so in those, in those cases, they've created Hecaton tables with durability equals schema only, whatever the keywords are. So that's step one. Uh, it, the other thing uh, you should notice that's in red there, every Hecaton table must have a primary uh, key index, and those can be either hash or range. Um, I'm not going to talk about today. We actually have a new kind of bee tree um, inside Hecaton called a BW tree. Uh, also totally latch free and lock free. Um, so it, uh, it allows us to get high performance on range queries as well as point lookups through the hash index. There are some schema limitations for V1. Um, I've already, I was cruising the web. People are complaining no blobs, no XML, et cetera. Um, you know, we will clean those up. Uh, and as I mentioned, ske durability can be schema, excuse me, oh, I'm not going to go back. Durability can be schema only. Second step, populate the table. And this is done, you can either run a select query to insert into select from a permanent or a, you know, a, a regular disk-based table, um, or you can do a bulk load from a file. So the same way you'd populate any table, you can populate a hecaton table. You just need to make sure it's going to fit in memory, OK? If you've got a, me a machine with a gigabyte of memory or 256 gigabytes of memory and try to put a terabyte table in it, uh, good luck to you, OK? Third step is just to use it. And you saw this with Tracy's demo yesterday. Uh, you can use the standard ad hoc T-SQL interface. And we turn that interop 
for a better, one of a better name. Uh, frequently see up to 3x boost, though your mileage and performance will vary depending on exactly what your query looks like. Or again, as Tracy illustrated yesterday, you can adapt, recompile, and execute T-SQL stored procs, and there we see 5x to 30x. And again, some language restrictions. Very, very, very minimal restrictions for the ad hoc T-SQL uh, query interface through interop. Uh, more language restrictions uh, on stored procs for uh, T-SQL. OK, so what have I done so far to recap? Why are we building a new query engine? We're building a new query engine because latches, locking as a concurrency control mechanism, and interpreted query plans simply make it impossible to get to um, 30x or 100x. Uh, number, number two, the, the, the what is actually pretty simple. It's a in-memory, high-performance, relational query engine that you can use in pretty much the standard way you're used to using SQL Server. Now, now I'd like to dive into some of the details. So SQL Server versus Hackathon. As we said earlier, SQL Server, classic SQL Server uses latches for shared data structure. Hackathon uses something called lock-free data structures. And I'm going to talk about that first, and then I'll talk about the concurrency control mechanism we use, and then compilation into a DLL. So a couple years ago, I talked about query optimization. And query optimization truly is the hardest part of a relational database system. And when I started to prepare this talk, or Reem and I started, I should say, started to prepare this talk, I tried to get a two or three slide presentation on lock-free data structures. And I discovered I could barely understand lock-free data structures, OK? Um, and if you think about a, a hash table or a linked list or a B tree, um, all the algorithms are hard. There's, there's no question that building a lock-free data structure and a set of methods to operate on that data structure, it, where you, whereas you might be able to write it in C and a couple dozen instructions, um, or in C++ and a couple dozen, dozen instructions, it might take you 1,000 or 10,000 instructions to get the same data structure in a lock-free manner. Uh, so I was challenged to try to explain it and just sort of like, OK, I can't really explain it adequately. Uh, they were actually invented by a professor at Brown named Maurice Herlihy. Um, uh, he got, got himself uh, elected to the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, Everyone trying to build high-performance data structures and software on modern CPUs with dozens and dozens of cores is turning to lock-free data structures. Yes, they're hard to build, uh, but they're the only way to get rid of all waiting and stalling CPUs due to latches and spin, spin locks. So lock-free is really a misnomer. Uh, it, to the programming language community and the operating system community, they use the term lock-free, but it's really, it's not about concurrency control. So when you, when you hear the phrasing lock-free, don't think about exclusive locks and shared locks. It's, think about latch-free. It's, it's allowing multiple processes or threads to access the same data structure without blocking. So since I couldn't explain it to you, um, I decided to give you a, a little demo of what it means, OK? Um, so here I have, on the top half of the slide, I have a, a linked list, very simple shared data structure. You actually have the lock table has chains of these things running through it. So this is um, not unusual. This, by lock, I mean concurrency control mechanism. So here we have a shared data structure, and we, those little insect-looking things, which so many people have complained about, those are threads, OK? So those are reader threads. And they're just going down this linked list, and the ones on the top have to go through a latch to get down this uh, data structure and look for some value, OK? The ones on the bottom, there's no latch. They're just going through this data structure, and they can do it because it's a latch-free uh, data structure, lock-free data structure in the terms of Maurice. Um, now, with two threads, they get about the same performance. And, you know, this animation took a lot of work, so I want good tweets about the animation. <laughs> okay. 
Now we've upped the concurrency. And the, you see the latch on top, well, it's starting to slow down those reader threads. And you know, they're only running on the speedometer on the right. And this is an animation, not real. Uh, they're, they're, they are running at about two thirds the speed as of the threads on the bottom. OK, and now we got four reader threads, and lock free is clearly doing better. But now we're going to up it. And, and you know, a real system will have hundreds of threads. Um, now we've got this eight threads going, and the latch on the top is smoking. OK? You know, there's, these threads are spin locking on this sucker. It's really, you know, and, and the latch free, lock free thing on the bottom, it's flat out. OK? It's like a Daytona car turning to the left, I guess. I don't really know. Uh, but so th this, is, this is read only. And now let me go one, one step further. And this is really, really, truly what's happening under the covers. Threads on the top are getting slowed down. And now we throw an update thread, one of these yellow insect looking chips, into the mix. Notice the readers all have stopped on the top. OK, I haven't done that to the bottom yet. The readers have all stopped. And until the updater finishes its work, they are, they are totally blocked from doing anything productive. We, meanwhile, we have these readers on the bottom still chunking away. And I'm going to stick an updater in there. Notice performance of the reads does not stop at all. The readers can continue to operate on this shared data structure even though there was an updater in the middle. No performance was lost. And this is really the, the brilliance of what Herlihy developed. He developed a whole class of data structures that allow you to have any number of reader or updater threads. And I showed it with just one updater to try to keep the animation under control with, with, without any performance hit, no latches, no slowing anything down. We've built all of Hecaton, every shared data structure in Hecaton, around this concept of lock free data structures. This is why it was not a one year effort, OK? It wasn't something we put together in response to a competitor, OK? We've been working on this for five years because these things are hard to do, but they give us performance that no one can match. OK, second thing SQL Server versus Hecaton. We've gotten rid of locking as you know it. And I'm going to now explain multi version, optimistic, time stamped concurrency control. It's a mouthful but it's really not that hard to understand. So wh what is the optimistic part? For the most part, conflicts between transactions are rare. And this was actually the idea of optimistic concurrency control was developed by a couple of faculty, a faculty member, H.C. Kung, and a grad student, Kung and uh, Robinson at Carnegie Mellon um, in, the, in the late 80s or early 90s. It assumes, unlike locking, which is kind of pessimistic, Optimistic concurrency control is optimistic. It assumes conflicts are rare. It allows transactions to run to completion without setting any locks. And then after the transactions finish, optimistic concurrency control goes through a validation phase, which I'm going to teach you about. The second component of Hecaton's concurrency control mechanism is multi-versioning. Updating a row doesn't update the row in place, it creates a new version of the row. Now, uh, other database systems have had this, but it works really well when you do this in memory. Because creating a, a, a new copy of a row is just a B copy from one location in memory to another location in memory, and it runs extremely fast. Finally, the third component of Hecaton's concurrency control mechanism is timestamps. Every row version has a range of timestamps during which it was valid associated with it. I'm going to go through these in great detail. Transactions use the timestamp they were given when they start to select the correct version. I'm going to illustrate that. And they timestamps are also used because they're not really timestamps as in wall clock time. They're they're ser they're serially numbered clock ticks and I'll show you how that works. Okay? The approach actually, by being optimistic, we, we, instead of having, needing hundreds of threads or thousands of threads to fully consume the CPU, we can get by with you know, only a few more threads than we have cores and max out the performance of the system. Reducing the number of threads reduces the number of conflicts. And 
therefore the chance that a, a transaction will not be committed. So here are the phases in, of a, a transaction goes through in Hecaton. We start with a begin step. And it's typical, no different than a typical transaction in a relational database system. In the, in the first phase, what we call the normal processing phase, transactions will read committed versions of rows. Actually, they can also read tentative versions of rows. I'm not going to try to explain that in detail today. Um, and you'll be able to find more details about that because we have a bunch of really nice white papers written on Hecaton. Updates create new versions of every, of a, every row they update. And finally, the, the database system keeps track of all the rows read, all the rows written, and all the rows deleted. And we call that the read set, the write set, and the scan set. Now, when the transaction is done, it goes through a second phase, which we call validation. So it hits a pre-commit point, then goes into validation. And that's where the concurrency control mechanism inside Hecaton decides whether the transaction can safely commit or not. Reaches the commit point, and then we do a post-processing phase, where we make our tentative versions visible to other transactions. And now I'm going to dive into each of these phases. So these timestamps get assigned from a global clock. The clock goes one, two, three, four, five, OK? Um, when the transaction begins, it, it grabs the current value of the clock. Multiple transactions can get that same concurrent value. So we call that the begin timestamp for the transaction. And it's used to select the correct version of each row to read. Now, when a transaction finish, it starts this validation phase at the pre-commit point. It gets a unique timestamp called the end timestamp. Every committing transaction is guaranteed to get a different value for its end timestamp. So, you know, transaction one was the first query is going to run is or transaction one is going to get one. Second one is going to run. It's going to get two, etc. That gives us a total order. And if you Think back on that locking example. What Gray proved was that if we use locks in a very conservative way, we can guarantee that the ordering, the resulting ordering, is equal to a serial order. With timestamp concurrency control, since every transaction gets a unique number at its commit pre-commit point, that gives us our total order. Total order is equal to serial order. So that's how we guarantee that serializability among the transactions. So that's really important to notice. Begin timestamps are not unique. End timestamps for transactions um, are always unique. Now, I don't have to say much about how Hecaton stores stuff in memory, because it, it, it's a pretty simple idea. There's either a hash table or a range index on the primary key. And you can see here I've got a simple example where there's a hash table and a very simple hash function, e. Um, uh, hashes to Elizabeth's row, and J hashes to John and Jane's row. And this is trivialization of how it actually works. Rows get allocated from SQL Service heap, heap storage, um, and there's a sort of pre-allocation phase that you go through to figure out how much you want to allocate towards Hecaton versus the standard buffer pool. So it's not, this data is not stored in the buffer pool, stored in SQL Service heap memory. The buffer manager also goes to that heap memory to get uh, pages for the buffer pool. And then, as I said a couple of times, all rows are organized using either a hash or a range. There's no heap. Okay? There has to be some form of index on a hecaton table. And it's possible to have one primary index, and you, know, you could have a hash primary index, range secondary index. So let's dive into one of those rows. So we look and we have the traditional fields, uh, name, uh, location, salary. Uh, we have this funny looking grounding arrow, like a grounding symbol. Um, and every row has associated with it, just as transactions have timestamps, all rows have a begin timestamp and end timestamp. Here we see Elizabeth has a begin timestamp of 20 and an end timestamp of infinity, because it's the latest version. Infinity on the end timestamp means the latest version of the row. When the trans, when, when the, the, the begin timestamp, let me not stumble over this, the begin timestamp is the end timestamp of the transaction that inserted it. 
So for Elizabeth, the, it was inserted by, this row was inserted into this employee table by the transaction whose end time stamp was 20. And remember, the end time stamps of transactions are always unique. Uh, and the end time stamp for row is the time stamp either the row, if the row is the latest row, it's got infinity in the end time stamp or some special symbol. Um, otherwise, it's the end time stamp is the, of the row is the end time stamp of the deleting trans, transaction or when a new row, a version of the row is created. So let's, just, let's look at this example. We have employee uh, Elizabeth, and this transaction wants to give Elizabeth a nice $10,000 raise. Um, and what, what happens? Well, the first step is that this transaction, because we never update in place, creates a new version of the row. And here's what it looks like initially. So we use those downward pointers to link all the rows, all the versions of a row that are currently uh, valid in some sense um, together in memory. Now, they don't have to be physically, you know, memory pointers can span the whole memory. So don't think about them being contiguous in memory. They could be anywhere in memory. The next step is the transaction puts its signature on those two spots. So it's got XV, it's got some transaction ID. It's not a timestamp, it's just some magic identifier we assign to a transaction. So it put its name in the end timestamp of the first row in the begin timestamp of, of the second version of this row. Okay, so that's, that's what happens in, inside Hecaton when a row gets updated. So, and you can see when it, after it makes a copy of the row that changes the salary from 80 to 90,000, uh, life is good. Now, at commit processing, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, what happens? So if, it, if XP is later validated and allowed to commit and given an end timestamp of 50, for every version of every row it either created or updated, it's going to come back and replace that XB with 50, as I've shown here. So before it got to validated, it left its sort of signature around XB. After it gets validated, and we know it's going to commit, we actually stick the transaction's end timestamp in, uh, in the appropriate spot of those two rows. And again, the second row has an end timestamp of infinity because it's the latest version. No latch is used, okay? This is super high performance. No lock set, okay? Locking is not gonna get in the way. No blocking of any transactions. You can have multiple transactions doing this simultaneously, and because we use these lock-free data structures, the right thing happens. And, and so this, we call this, this time stamp, we call this time stamp and versioning. We use timestamps both on the rows and on the transactions. We always create new versions of rows when we're doing updates. And life truly is swell. This is really, and, and, and trust me, if you look under the covers of any of our competitors' products, they're not doing lock-free, they're not doing multi-version timestamp, they're not going to have the same kind of performance we can get. Two concurrent transactions. And again, okay, bloggers, you can beat up on me for pushing product too hard. Take it easy. I love this product. You know, I got to lead the project at the beginning, so get, cut me some slack here, okay? Now what happens with two concurrent transactions? Uh, XA starts. Uh, it gets a time, begin timestamp at 25. XB starts, okay? I hope you notice I color-coded all these things appropriately. Uh, XB starts. It gets a begin timestamp of 35. There's just one row in the database, okay? This is the hardest case to handle. Now, XB creates a new version. We've seen what it does. Creates, creates a copy of it. Um, it, gets, uh, it, it puts its identifier in it. And along come XA, and it tries to read the row. And it, it's going to use its timestamp of 25 to pick the correct row, okay? And what is the correct row? Well, X, XB's start timestamp is 35. That means it's, if it gets to commit, its, it's end timestamp is going to be strictly greater than 35. It, let's say it gets to be 50. So why is this correct? Well, XA looks at what, 
what XP's time, begin timestamp is. Notice, and again, all this is under the covers, all this is done magically for you. If the begin timestamp of XP is 35, its commit timestamp has got to be greater. And therefore, when it encounters this row, or encounters back, let me back up, encounters this situation where, where XB hasn't committed yet, it's going to use its timestamp of 25, and it, it's going to figure out the commit, the earliest commit timestamp of XB being strictly greater than 35, and it's going to say the correct version to run at to, to read is the first version of the Elizabeth row. And that's why this works out to be correct. So it will read the first version, and it's in effect going to serialize XA before XB. Now let's compare the two. So on the top, I've got optimistic hecaton. You know, on the bottom, I've got locking. This is why we love this optimistic multiversion. XA starts simultaneously in both systems. Then XB starts. X, XB creates a new version of the Elizabeth row with optimistic. With locking, it sets an exclusive lock because it's going to update it in place. Okay? XA reads the old version under optimistic. Under locking, XA is blocked. X, B is going to wander around the stage a little bit. It's going to think about things. Eventually, XB uh, is going to do the update because it set the lock and it's eventually going to do the update. And eventually, XB is committed. Meanwhile, XA is stalled doing nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. With optimistic, XA is long gone out of the system. OK? And XB eventually, XB eventually commits. Because we had this version, we were able to serialize XA before XB because we had this old version laying around. Now, you might say, wow, this looks wrong. With optimistic, XA is serialized before XB. With locking, XA sees XB's update. There is no determinism. Serialization is not, it, it, database system will never guarantee you that XA is going to happen before XB or XA is going to happen after XB unless you actually run them inside this from the same program. Database system doesn't say one is right or one is wrong. All it's trying to do is say one is serialized before or after the other. So the fact that the two different concurrency control schemes gave different results that's, that's just fine, OK? Uh, and it, it is correct. Now you might say, oh my god, the memory's going to be filled with garbage. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Um, when is it safe to delete the first version of the Elizabeth row? You know, we've had XB commit. Um, when can we get rid of it? Well, it's actually really, really simple. When, when the begin timestamp of the oldest query in the system ticks past 50, it's not possible for the, any query to ever read the first version. And along comes the garbage collector. It's going to say, oh, and, and we actually attach garbage, garbage collection to running queries, so we do this cooperatively. It's non-blocking. It's cooperative. It's not like Java. Don't think, worry about the Java you know, this, you know, thing stopping the whole world while it does garbage collection. Don't even notice it. It's incremental, it's cooperative, it's non-blocking, it's parallel. Uh, it really, it's, it's an amazing, again, amazing piece of work why, why we took year, a number of years to bring this to productization. Minimal impact on performance. But there's a very clean semantics about when we can clean up old versions, and it happens totally under the covers. Um, so wrap up. Updates, here, here's what you need to remember. Updates create new versions. Every version has a valid timestamp range, number one. Number two, transactions use a combination of timestamps and versions for concurrency control. So no, no latches, no locks, optimistic timestamp multiversions. And again, timestamps, multiversion, optimistic, they were actually an idea that was competing for standard locking back when Jim sort of led the world down the locking path. Um, and 
there, there are a lot of reasons why timestamps, optimistic, and multiversion don't work in disk-based systems. Um, and, but they work, they're just ideal for main memory resonant systems. Point number three, transactions are only allowed to read versions that overlap their range. So let's pretend the begin timestamp of uh, a transaction is 30. XA can see rows in the range of 10 to not finished, uh, still valid, 20 to 150, because 30 isn't between 20 and 150. But it can't see versions which were created with time timestamps of 40. Okay, so XB is, has a begin timestamp of 30, not allowed to see those kind of versions. Again, all under the covers. And it's, and it's why we get such great performance out of the system. Transactions essentially never block. There's a small caveat to that, but you don't need to know that. Second phase. Well, it, it has to do with speculative locks, and it's, it's really, it's, it's uh, not a big deal. Second phase, determining whether a, a transaction commi can commit. We call that the validation phase. So as I said before, every committing transaction that goes before it starts validation gets a unique value from the clock. So it basically goes to the clock, increments the clock, grabs the value as a compare and swap operation. So this is done atomically. If you have multiple, people, multiple transactions trying to commit or go through validation simultaneously, they will all get unique values. Again, no latches set, okay? So the clock gets incremented, assigned to the transaction, and then uh, as an atomic operation. So every committing transaction gets a unique value from the clock and increments the clock as part of the process. Step two is determine if the transaction can be safely committed. Now, validation steps depending on the isolation level. If, if all you want to run at is snapshot isolation, no work required during validation. Boom, through validation, okay? If you want repeatable reads, you need something called read stability. And if you want serializable, you get, have to get read stability and phantom avoidance. And I'll talk about those briefly. So read stability is really simple. When, it, when a transaction that's running at, uh, at uh, uh, repeatable reads or uh, serializable, one, it goes through validation, um, we check we check whether the versions of each row it read are still the right, the, the, late, the correct version to be accessed. This doesn't involve rerunning the query. It involves keeping track of using this thing we call the read set, which kept track of every record read. And we just reaccess it. It's very quick. If, we, if, the, if the versions were on disk, it'd be a disaster. Since all the versions are in memory, we haven't removed any of them, very, very minimal impact. So that's what we do, uh, and I'm gonna skip this, but you can look at it later. So we track the read set, uh, we use the end timestamp to, re to quote unquote reread all the rows, it's really not rereading them, it's reaccessing them. And if any one of these reaccesses returns a different version, then validation fails and the transaction is aborted. There's a concurrency control conflict, and we're trying to serialize a transaction that's trying to commit a transaction that can, cannot be serialized. Phantom avoidance, same sort of idea. We have to re repeat every scan. If we're scanning a big table, we're going to reaccess all those rows, do the same thing. It sounds expensive, that's true, uh, but remember, all the rows are in memory. It's still a lot cheaper than setting locks, which imply latches. Uh, and it's only incurred by those transactions running at serializable. So, uh, you know, yes, you know, you, you pay one way, Paul Larson, who's an MSR researcher who contributed a lot of the key ideas to this, to the Hecaton project. Um, Paul describes it as you, you pay for what you get. If you want serializable, you're going to pay more. Uh, if you just want repeatable reads, you're going to pay a little bit less. Um, and, and you basically, it's pay as you go, and, and you don't impose a cost on anybody else. You incur the cost as your, each transaction incurs the cost uh, that is, corresponds to the serialization level it wants to run at. Post-processing, uh, that's making tentative versions visible to other transactions. And there are three phases. First thing we do is we generate a log record. The log record has all new versions of the rows created by the transaction, the primary key of all the deleted rows, one big log record. 
log record is forced to disk. Uh, the log records go in the standard SQL Server log. Remember, this is fully integrated as part of SQL Server 2014. For all rows in the transactions write set, we go through that process of replacing the transaction's little ID, magic ID, with its end timestamp. So we showed this before. We do it. We, we, we created a second version. This transaction XV created the second version of Elizabeth, gave her a nice raise, uh, and we go through and make those changes. That's in the post-processing phase. So normal processing, to repeat, the normal processing phase, transactions run through the database system pretty much without any restrictions. The only thing that's done a little bit differently is um, they create new versions of rows that they update or delete, or update or insert, I should say. Um, the validation phase, we go through the process of determining whether a transaction can be safely committed. And then the post-processing phase, we clean up after ourselves and exit the system. Again, all totally under the covers. Now, what about checkpoints and recovery? Well, you know, Hecaton, the data is not lost. We have a normal checkpointing process. Uh, we use the logs to generate the checkpoints. Um, this is all done totally under the covers, incremental, non-blocking, parallel. Um, recovery, same thing. Uh, uh, system fails, we'll recover from the ch latest checkpoint, and, the, and we'll scan the log forward um, so that no work on, on tables that are memory optimized and durable is, is ever lost. Fully integrated with our HA story. So that'll give readable secondaries on Hekanon tables uh, out, out of the box. Didn't hold this up for V2. We got full integration with, with uh, Hadron, the, our HR, our uh, high availability uh, software. OK, almost to the end here. So query execution. As I talked about earlier, the standard way of executing queries um, on a normal relational uh, engine is to do interpretation. Not sufficiently high performance for a system like Hecaton. OK, click. Uh, so there are two alternative ways of using Hecaton. I'm going to talk about those. Regular T-SQL access, what we call interop. This can access queries in the interop mode, can access regular tables, Hecaton tables, Apollo clustered column indices. Interop uses interpreted execution. OK, so that was when, when Tracy gave the demo yesterday, the first click was to convert his regular table into a Hecaton table. And that gave you know, some number of x performance improvement, 8x or 10x. I can't quite remember what it did. The second click, uh, and, and, but the system continued to run in, in interrupt mode, as, as I understood what was going on. The other alternative, which was the second click, is to take the stored proc and compile it into C, and then into a DLL. And, and here you get much, much, much faster performance. So I'm going to give a, an example. This is a customer sales table. We have customers with names, how much they have on their credit card, the sales, and what they bought. Okay. So here I'm looking for customers who have expensive TV habits. I'm not one of those people. Okay. So I'm not. This is not after myself. Um, they owe more than thirty thousand uh, dollars to the uh, to Amazon. Let's say. Um, they uh, bought TVs from Sony, and they spent more than $10,000 on their TV. I, you know, spent only $10,000 on something else. So here's what normally happens. The query goes through a parser, uh, gets a parse tree, does semantic analysis. Um, you end up with a query tree involving some selections, picking customers who have more than uh, $30,000 in, in debt, um, who bought expensive TVs, the selection on the right. And then the join gets together to produce our result. After we produce a logical plan, we feed it through a query optimizer. That produces what we call a physical plan. It actually substitutes, for example, merge join for the logical operator join. Might have used a hash join, a nested loops join, index nested loops join. It can, the physical, the optimizer will pick what it thinks is the best plan. Second phase is to take this physical plan and feed it into this interpreter. Uh, this thing is totally generic, OK? It works on any table, any query, um, any combination of attribute types. 
um, any physical database design. It is absolutely totally generic. And consequently, it's not very fast. Okay? It's as, and it, as I said earlier, it's as fast as it needs to be when the data sits on disk, but when the data sits in memory, uh, you pay for that generic ability uh, to, to run any kind of query. And we call that, we're going to call that for now, we're going to refer to that in some performance results I show you, interrupt mode. Now, native plan generation. So when Tracy pushed that button, he basically did native plan generation. Query goes through the parse tree, same thing, produces a logical plan, and then feeds it into the query optimizer, um, which produces a physical plan. The steps up top are exactly the same. Parse, catalog, view, security, all that stuff is exactly the same because we're fully integrated. Um, but the physical plans are likely to be different. Different algorithms, different cost models. So the query optimizer has been tuned to understand that the plan, that the, that the plan is going to get rec run against memory resident table. The second part of native plan generation, what we call native mode, um, is take this physical plan and translate it into C code. And it's the ugliest C code you've ever seen in your life, OK? It has no function calls at all, all go-tos. Function calls took a few cycles, didn't use function calls. This is truly the ugliest code you've ever seen in your life. Uh, gets fed into the C compiler, you might say, oh my god, I've got to invoke the C compiler. Well, you know, we've sort of streamlined the C compiler. Um, yeah, it takes maybe a little bit of time, but the fact of the matter is the goal is to run this thing repeatedly, especially if it's a stored proc. The cost of feeding it through the C compiler, uh, not worth worrying about. The DLL that gets produced is, it's got this, it's like really slim. It's got only the stuff in it needed to run this stored proc. It doesn't need, if, if, if you don't have any string attributes or, you know, you don't have any blob, you know, it doesn't have any of this stuff, the generic optimizer. It's, it's totally targeted for exactly the query that you're going to run. The, the DLL then gets invoked and loaded. And notice we don't do this every time you invoke the stored proc. We do it once, okay? And we store the DLL in the catalogs in some safe spot. And then when you re-invoke the stored proc, They'll get loaded into memory and cached in memory. So that's native plan execution. And here's an example of um, when I talked to you about we're trying to do this to get 100x. Here's some examples. So there's a, this is a small piece of the predicate um, of that query that's trying to find customers in debt who spent a lot of money on TV sets. And here, so we have, a, you know, is the item of TV, is the price greater than greater than 1,000, ended with uh, manufacturer equals Sony. We actually, I got uh, Craig Friedman, who I'll acknowledge a little bit later on, to actually go and measure some numbers for me. Now, classic table. Quentin and I are still struggling about how to talk about what would SQL Server, think of classic table as SQL Server without Hecaton, if we didn't put Hecaton into SQL Server 14. So that's what that classic column means. The second column has the, hecaton, the data in the hecaton table, but using the interpreted query processor. Obviously, for the first column, you can only use the, 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 classic, the interpreted query processor currently. Um, the third column is what you would see with hecaton. And, and I just asked for CPU cycles, or the number of instructions executed per row. So for every row of the table, you apply the predicate this predicate to, it, if the row matches, it takes about 700 seconds. If you've used a hecaton table but the interpreter, it takes 330 instructions. And if you use the native compiled into a DLL, you get, you take, it takes 75 instructions to apply this predicate to a row. So there's where we're getting our CPU bang for the buck. We get, we're getting 10x on, the, on this comparison for every single row we process, assuming you go the whole way to native mode. And two is the case, two and a half x. Uh, if the row doesn't match, if it fails the predicate, we can short circuit some of the evaluations. 300 instructions, 110 instructions, 31 instructions. So here, you know, this, this compiling into a DLL saves us a huge number of instructions. And again, why do we do this? Well, we want the, A, the system to run fast, but B, CPUs aren't getting any faster, okay? 
So to summarize, interop mode, standard SQL Server parse, optimize, execute, eases transitions of applications into the native mode. That's why we built it. Um, arbitrary mix of uh, disk resonant table, clustered column indices, hackathon tables, very minimal restrictions. Uh, almost full T-SQL interface. Of course, I had full T-SQL interface, and I got beat up a little bit for that. Not quite there by the, by the devs. You know, about 3x, about. Not always, up to. Uh, in native mode, 10 to 30x available, possible for certain workloads. And they don't have to be straight OLTP, anything that's really high, highly memory intensive. It does require some rewrites of stored procs. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get better at that in the future. Um, but all tables referenced must be hecaton tables. And again, somewhat limi limited language surface for the first. Uh, it's typical select, insert, delete, SQL statements, inner joins, sort, top. But there are some things, and you can't have XML. I don't really like XML. Um, uh, then I had nothing to do with that, sorry. Uh, uh, you know, there, there are restrictions, sorry, okay, a little. Okay, some performance numbers. So these are just some results, okay? And I don't pretend that, that they will match, and you should not expect that you'll always get these kind of results. But here's some simple little tests that we've run. Those, the earlier things were really looking at CPU performance on an individual row basis. I'm gonna show you a couple different results uh, we ran. Uh, take a hecaton table, put 10 million rows in it, do random lookups, all data in memory. Uh, that was the CPU. Classic table, again, is SQL Server, what SQL Server 2014 would do w without using hecaton. Uh, the hecaton table is native mode, um, you know, uh, and, and the, the number row, the, the rows corresponding to the number of data lookups, 1, 10, 100, 1,000. And you see across the board, you know, uh, 10 to 20x. The, the, the more rows you look up inside uh, this, each transaction, the better you get. But again, you know, 10 to 30x, pretty reasonable. Second version is we took the same table and we did random updates. Uh, one index snapshot isolation. Uh, classic table, hecaton table, there's the speed up. Here we vary the number of rows updated inside uh, the transaction, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. So, and, and, you know, again, these are some example results. Um, uh, and I stand behind these results. I totally trust. It's not marketing. I totally trust the people that measure um, that gave these results, and I hope you will trust me. Uh, and the hectare performance, 1.9 million updates per second per core. Truly, truly, the, the, the hecaton team did really, really great work. Um, here's a high contention situation. We uh, have a table uh, with unique index on it. We have an insert transaction. 50% of the transactions are insert transactions. They append a batch of 100 rows. Uh, the read transaction uh, uh, reads the last inserted rows. Uh, the red bar is classic SQL Server uh, without hecaton. Uh, uh, green is interop, uh, and purple uh, is what native will give you. And you see about a factor of 10 to 15x as we go across and vary the number of CPUs. Uh, so we have four CPUs, eight CPUs, 12 CPUs. And the difference between classic SQL Server and Hecaton on, with, with 12 CPUs, uh, about 15x. So even in high intensive update workloads. So we've got some customers. Uh, BWIN has been using it for a while, session state, uh, about 17x uh, read and updates for every web interaction. We've gotten, they've been working with Hecaton for a long time, uh, and they see about 17x. Um, SBI liquidity, uh, they've gone from 2,500 transactions per second with a four second delay to over 7,000 transactions a second with less than a one second latency, about three. It's hard to actually talk about, is that 3x or is it, is it 12x because the latency has gone down? But you get the idea. Uh, uh, EdgeNet, they do rapid ingest. They used to be limited by the, probably the tail insert problem. They've gone from 7,500 rows a second to over 100,000, 125,000 rows per second. Again, about 17x. Again, you know, there will be customers that will try this that will go slower. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, 
you know, as we expand the number of customers using the product, we will continue to enhance and tune it so it covers, gives great performance for more and more applications. So a quick recap. Uh, hardware trends. We have this steadily declining memory prices. We want to build a main memory optimized uh, database. Many core processors. If we're going to have machines like the DL980 with you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of cores. We want to use them effectively. We can't have latches. We can't use locking to hold things up. We've designed a completely new database system to handle that. Stalling CPU clock rate. If you did interpreted query execution on a system like this, it's going to be the bottleneck. And so we took, we, we, we took advantage of our language and compiler expertise to take T-SQL and compile it into machine code. To, to deal with the stalling CPU clock rates. Business driver. We believe the business driver is total cost of ownership. Oh, oh, go backwards. Fully integrated into SQL Server 2014. Same experience, uh, you know, uh, high availability. Uh, I think really, really a, a nice product, and I think you'll find it the same way. A few more details. Uh, this afternoon at 1.30 um, in room 208B, there's going to be a DBA-focused session. Tomorrow morning, an application applic uh, session for application developers. Uh, Friday at 1, uh, a CAT team is going to have a session. And I've been told I'm meeting with people at some Microsoft spot at 11, so I'll be there to answer questions from 11 to 12. Uh, um, now I'd like to give some thanks. Christian, Craig, and Mike, all initial developers on the Hecaton team. Uh, they were there at the beginning. They're there today. Uh, I wish they were here so I could bring them on stage. Hideaki, who helped me with that uh, uh, crazy animation on Lock Free. And finally, I'd like to bring on stage Rima, who's uh, the co-author of this talk. Rima Nemi, I'd like you to give it up for Rima. Stand over here. Uh, Rima was supposed to be at work today, and instead she left her six-month-old baby at home, got on an airplane, slept in some crummy hotel last night, and totally surprised me uh, with being here today. Uh, but I can't say enough. Rima's one of my employees, actually the developer, the key developer that started the Polybase project. Uh, and uh, these talks um, take us a very long time, and I couldn't do them without Rima. Uh, she was still... Uh, only four months into her maternity leave or two months into her maternity leave when we started working on this talk. Um, and without her uh, helping me, you know, develop the talk, make it coherent, um, uh, these talks, I've been really privileged to work with Rima on these talks for the last few years. Um, it's really, Rima get, should get credit for doing this. But here's what she really thinks, okay? <laughs> and fine by me. Thank you, Rima. <laughs> Uh, in case you want to, uh, don't forget to vote. Uh, uh, if you'd like to get copies of this talk, if you go to graysystemslab.com, the URL is just impossible to write down. You can just remember this, graysystemslab.com. Um, click on people, click on me. I got this picture there. If you scroll down through the, that web page, you'll find a place where uh, you'll find the, this talk and the other past keynotes I've given. Um, you're, I encourage you to take a look at the talk. It's very big. You have to install certain fonts. There's a README. It's zipped. Um, uh, and uh, I encourage you to take a look at it and send me, if you've got questions, send me mail. And I guess I'm now one minute over time. So uh, thank you very much, and thank you for having me back. Thank you.